If today's video inspires you to head towards the classifieds in search of something 911 shaped, don't forget to take Car Vertical with you. The super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases from around the globe to give you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase. From things like MOT failure points, to accident damage regardless of whether a car was written off or not, potential mileage discrepancies, and even things like usage as a taxi, fire claims, or outstanding finance. Even better, the car vertical discount I've got has just been doubled from 10 to 20%. The code is still the same, JM, and for more information, check out my link in the description or the comment section down below. Hello everybody. Though I certainly do not consider myself a Porsche fanboy, I do think of myself as a Porsche fan. And when it comes to the 911, that's a car I have a lot of time for. My dad has owned a couple of them, my mum has had a couple of them, I've had one and I have driven dozens of them and enjoyed just about every single one. However, when it came to the new 992 generation, released now six years ago, that for me fell a little bit flat. And I have driven plenty of those too, from the entry level Carrera 2 up to the GT3 with stop-offs on the way, including a Targa 4 GTS and a Carrera 4S cab. And just about every one of them has left me feeling somewhat underwhelmed and wishing instead that I was driving exactly the same thing from the generation previously. There is though one rather important model that I've missed out. That is the Turbo. And so today, at long last, I've got my hands on a 992 Turbo S, what many consider to be one of the best in the lineup. And I'm now gonna find out whether I agree or if this, like its brethren, is also a bit of a disappointment. for me no arguing that the 911 is an automotive icon, but even in such illustrious company, the Turbo has managed to form its own legend. Though what I find particularly curious about it is that in the 50 years or so that it's been around, its reputation has changed quite dramatically. In the early days, it was considered by many to be the wildest of all 911s, a car that already had a somewhat fearsome reputation, and the Turbo was seen really as something purchased mostly by those that didn't really have much of a sense of self preservation. Later, the car evolved, became a little more rounded, a little more refined, and particularly with the introduction of all-wheel drive for the 993 generation, transformed itself into more of an autobahn blaster. And today, it is seen by many as effectively the quickest way to get from A to B, with most people viewing it essentially as the daily drivable supercar. And though I never really considered any 911 a supercar, I get and agree with the sentiment. What marks the Turbo out though, is that where the 911 itself was never really a car that on paper seemed to make an awful lot of sense, never having anywhere near as much power as its rivals from say BMW or Mercedes, certainly for the money, the Turbo is the opposite. This has always been the car of choice for your top Trumps fan. No matter which generation it is that you're looking at, a Turbo was always a fearsome performer. And if ever it were to appear in a group test with the likes of Bentleys, Aston Martins, Lamborghinis or Ferraris, this was always the car that set the benchmark and very often came out on top despite the fact it cost quite a bit less. and the 992 generation turbo is no different. If anything, this was also a car that really had a lot to prove because as of the facelift of the last generation, every 911 now had a turbo in it. So more than ever, this car really had to justify what exactly made it stand out from its peers. And before we get on with the rest of the review, my patent pending three point turn hill start torture test, where the car actually does very well. Visibility's pretty good. Car's got hill hold, nice, well behaved. Yeah, perfect score there. So then, what's new for this? Well, first off, the engine. Out went the old 3.8 litre flat six twin turbo and in came a new 3.7, well, 3.745 litre flat six twin turbo derived from the three litre unit as seen in the regular Carrera. It makes here a staggering 650 horsepower. That's 70 more than the outgoing model, the biggest leap in turbo history. 
The turbo has always been a quick car, but in the 992, Porsche really turned it up a bit. Torque is now 800 Newton meters, that's 590 pound foot. And because the engine now has such an abundance of it, they've done away with the old overboost feature. Previously, if you wanted access to the car's maximum twist, you had to have the Sport Chrono in the right setting, and it would give you it for only a set period. Now, you've always got access to it, provided you're at the right RPM. To help the car tackle that, it now comes as standard with an uprated version of the 8-speed PDK, Porsche's dual-clutch transmission, and naturally all-wheel drive. Should you want your turbo with a manual, there is only one way you're going to be able to get it, and that's by buying a Sport Classic, which is a completely different kettle of fish. As regards the turbo, though, this, I think, is a keynote speaker at the annual acronym convention because the car is absolutely loaded with the things. First off, you've got the aforementioned PDK. That is joined by PTV, Porsche Torque Vectoring. Then you also have here in the S standard PDCC, Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, that's active anti-roll bars. PCCB, Porsche Carbon Ceramic Brakes. You also have the latest version of PCM, that's Porsche Communication Management, i.e. the sat-nav. Other numbers if you need to impress people? Well, 0-62 is now dispatched with in 2.7 seconds, and the car will achieve a top speed comfortably in excess of 200 mile an hour. It even has active aerodynamics. You've got the classic pop-up spoiler at the back, and even a little deployable lip at the front. This really, really is a very clever car. Now, as a member of the 992 generation of 911, there are, of course, a lot of things shared with all of the others, some of which I like and some of which I do not. On the good side, I have to say that this particular car is probably the best looking of them all. Nowhere near as shouty as the GT3, but a little more distinctive than the regular Carrera and its ilk. With the 992, all 911s are now wide body, but the turbo is even wider still, now being 1.9 meters shoulder to shoulder. It's a big thing. You park this next to particularly a 996 or 997 and certainly an air-cooled car, and it looks frankly comical. But it is worth remembering that compared with many other supercars out there, it is still on the narrow side. But I do think that with this generation, the 911 has somewhat lost its USP of being narrow enough you can drive it anywhere without concern. It's still a fairly usable thing, but just not quite as usable as it once was. Inside, I'm also of mixed opinions. The overall design is, of course, exactly the same as every other 992. So you have this daft display here, half of which is obscured by the steering wheel. You've got the lint moat surrounding the silly little brawn shaver that, in operation, actually I've become somewhat used to, but don't like looking at. And then, honestly, just frankly daft, this cup holder in the middle. Old school 911 cup holders were a work of art. This is lazy, it's poor design, and to me, it just smacks a little bit of corner cutting that in something like a 911 shouldn't be going on. In good news, with the Turbo S, you do get quite a few things as standard, and most of them come specified with a very nice interior, some of which is standard, some of which is not. And if you want to know which is which, check out the Porsche configurator. But this particular car, I actually really like. The crayon grey is not my colour of choice, but it does suit it somehow, particularly on a dull, overcast day like today. It fits the 911 Turbo's brief of being understated, but still elegant. And again, inside, there are enough nice materials in the place that it does feel like a step up over any other 992 that I've been in. It all is, really, a very, very good start. On the move, the car then is interesting, is the word I think I want to use here, because it's got a near constant jitter about it. And that's unfortunate, because you see, one of the things that to me always made the Turbo interesting is that though the GT3 is the car everybody lusts after, we also all knew that the Turbo was the sensible buy. In fact, in many cases, the Turbo was just as quick around a track as a GT3 for your all unimportant pub bores, but let's face it, most GT3 owners don't take their car on track, so it was ultimately irrelevant. On the road, though, the Turbo was always the far nicer place to be. And though it is equipped with all sorts of fancy stuff, including another acronym I've forgotten, PASM, Porsche Active Suspension Management, which you can have either as standard height or with a 10mm drop, 
this is on standard height, it's just, yeah, very firm. Not unpleasantly so, not certainly GT3 levels, but firmer than I was expecting. This might be due in part to the fact that for this generation of turbo, Porsche wanted the car to handle more like a Carrera. And it is carrying a fair bit of weight, this, 1,650 kilos, and perhaps that was something they decided had to be done in order to achieve their goals. I'm less convinced. I'm more of the opinion that, like most 911s, this has just been set up a little bit too stiffly for British roads. What I think they consider normal here should really be called sport. It's just, it's just not quite right. You also get quite a bit of tire roar in the cabin, even as I am now doing sort of 45, 50 mile an hour. Still though, it's a very pleasant thing to drive. And I also want to say that actually in comparison to say the Carrera, the steering feel does seem to be a little improved. There's certainly more of it. The wheel feels just a, a little bit more alive. The car has rear wheel steer, also a standard, and you do feel like it's a very, very agile thing, this. And so let's put that to the test, shall we? I'm gonna put the mode selector into Sport, not Sport Plus. You can hear it get a little more vocal. The chassis is still in its normal mode. The road is fairly clear. I'm gonna put it into Manual too, and Let's see how this car fares through a very tight demanding set of bends that should really allow any great 911 to shine. But will it do so for this? First off, let's test the traction. Very good. Unsurprisingly so, and this has always been a 911 turbo party piece, where something like a Ferrari Roma would just be, well, back there still going sideways, this just gets on with it. Ah. Curious, it's gone back into drive. Got to press the button down here for manual, apparently, if I wanted to stay in it. That's frustrating, considering I was in sport anyway. <clears throat> right. Yeah, it's quick, this thing. Really, really quick. Let's try this bend out. How's the steering? Yeah, nice. I like it. The engine. Let's talk about that because you see, this is not actually my first time driving a 992 Turbo S. I got a go in one a good few years ago. It was at Goodwood, not on track, on the road, thanks to Porsche GB, and uh, I had about 10 minutes in the car. I didn't really come out all that impressed, and the engine was really the key thing I didn't like because I felt it to be very, very laggy. Perhaps it's because it's soaking wet out there and the car would struggle to put the power down full stop, but through that little section there, it didn't really seem to have much of an issue. So I'm gonna get it onto another straight, try again and see what it does, but thus far, it's actually pretty good. And in terms of power, well, it's got far, far more than you're ever going to need. This thing is devastatingly quick. I also happen to think it makes a pleasant enough noise. The fact is, most 911 turbos never sounded all that raucous from the off anyway, and this at least does sound like a 911. When David turned up in it this morning, I knew it was him before I could see him because I heard the distinctive and distant sound of a flat six rumble. What more do you want? Okay, right, let's test the flexibility of that engine. So I am in third gear at 35 mile an hour doing two and a half thousand RPM, which puts me smack bang in the middle of that peak torque. We've got nothing oncoming, nothing behind me, and foot down, nothing, 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 nothing. There's the full boost. It is laggy, this thing, it is. That may be due in part to the fact that, yes, it does make quite a bit more power than the outgoing car, and okay, the engine is smaller, but by a meaningless amount. Curiously, I have seen a few pictures of the engine lid where it says 3.8 still. This one, though, just says Turbo S. But what has also changed is the compression ratio, and that has fallen quite dramatically. In the old car, it was 9.8 to one. In here, it's 8.7. For some context, the Ferrari Roma is 9.4 to 1, and that's a car with a marginally larger engine, 3.9 litres, but that makes slightly less of both power and torque. However, it is also one of the best engines I have ever experienced. That really has no turbo lag. You genuinely don't feel it ever. This 
it is certainly there and noticeable. Does it ruin the driving experience? Well, that's a difficult question. On a day like today, I'm in part sort of thankful for a very progressive delivery of the turbo power. However, with my journalist -y hat on, I do have to be somewhat critical because the fact is that even in the 997 generation, Porsche really did have a handle on the whole turbo lag thing. And so to see it reappear, to me is a bit of a step backwards. Audi had the same thing. The new RS6 is very laggy, and I think for the same reason. Similar capacity engine, but now bigger turbo, lower compression ratio, which gives it better in laboratory emissions figures and allows it to make more peak power. But in the real world, it does give you quite a bit of lag. Next up, let's talk about this 8-speed PDK gearbox, which again is actually a bit better than I remember it being. Around town, it's sometimes a, a little slow to respond, but that's really not an issue. However, when out and about, well, let's just check, shall we? I put the car into Sport Plus mode back there just to make sure it was giving me the most aggressive shifts that it could. And though it's quick enough, it is what I'd call effective, not exciting. Now, in truth, in something like a Turbo S, that is less of a criticism than in, say, the GT4 RS, where it was really much the same. But again, I do recall the old PDK being a little more visceral, a little more engaging. This is just quite exciting enough for me. However, there are also plenty of other good things about the car. The brakes are sensational. The fact I haven't really thought about them tells you that the pedal is set up perfectly and honestly they have plenty of stopping power, far more than I could possibly use on a day like today. These standard fit 18-way Sport Plus seats or whatever they want to call them are also absolutely brilliant. The quality of the material seems nice enough and they do have far, far more adjustment than I think you could really ever want, but that means you should be able to get comfortable. The view out, as already mentioned, is also good, although the car has lost a little of the definition that you get in old 911s. The bonnet is now more flat, less rounded, which does add to the sense of the width of the thing. When you do also begin to press on, the suspension does start to work a little bit more, and I can see that they had in their head they wanted to make this a more sportily orientated car. Annoyingly, I haven't actually driven ever, either on or off camera, any of the 991 generation of Turbo 911. And if you do happen to have one and you'd like to see it on the channel, please send me an email. My address is in the description of every video. It's talk at jm.com. And you know, driving it now, I can actually see why David likes it so much. And that is because previous to this, he had a number of cars, including both a 991.2 GT3 with the manual gearbox and an Audi RS6. But he then made the mistake of buying himself a 981 Boxster. And as soon as he got that, he found himself never really driving the GT3 for fear of not really putting miles on it, but more taking it down a road that would be unsuitable. And also with a car like that, you do really need to be in the mood to get the best from it. Having then found himself just really not using the GT3, he thought it was a bit of a waste. So decided to combine that and the RS6 into this. And when you look at it from that perspective, okay, sure, space overall is limited in terms of both passengers and luggage. Up front, it's got some room, but not masses. And then behind me, it's the same story as every 911. It's okay if you're small, not if you're not. But the car does drive a little firmer, a little sportier, some like to say it, than I would expect it to. Coming from a GT3, though, that would appeal. Having a better turbo lag also, coming from an RS6, that wouldn't be an issue. And it's definitely, definitely got plenty of shove to please even, I think, the most pessimistic of petrol heads. R35 GTR fans, I think, would be very, very happy with this. I think also the fact the regular car is now turbocharged and the likes of Litchfield are tuning them is another reason Porsche really felt like they had to put some effort in with this. And so they have.
it is nice to see people on horseback being friendly to people in a car. I think the young lady saw the cameras mostly, but <laughs> yeah. Now I came today fully equipped to give this car a proper bashing because the last time I drove it, I just wasn't in love with it. But here and now, though I don't think it'd be my car of choice, and again, like many other 992s, I'd probably be happier in an older turbo, certainly a 997, I do get the appeal. There are, though, just a couple of issues. One of which is the fact that, and I don't quite know how this happened, but Porsche dealers, it would appear, certainly in Britain, managed to convince people that a Turbo S was going to be the next best thing to buying a GT3. These landed, essentially, as Covid did, and that was a time that shifting any car became very difficult. Maybe that had something to do with it, but historically, getting your hands on a Turbo was never that difficult, certainly not as hard as a GT3. With these, though, they became just as sought after, and very quickly, people were apparently willing to pay very large premiums to get one that I never really understood. This has all now come crashing down, as detailed in a recent video of mine, and where, not too long ago, people were paying a quarter of a million pounds for a new one of these, now they're not. And they've started appearing in the classifieds at very reasonable prices, so you can get one for 140,000 quid, for example, and at that money, it's a lot of car. When you consider that today a brand spanking new entry level no option C2 is a hundred grand, well, it's a no brainer if you can afford it. This whole thing I didn't like, and honestly, it just served to sour my view of the 992 Turbo S. There is also another problem, and for me, a potentially much larger one, which is the fact that on launch, these cars were £156,000, or near as makes no difference. But when I went and checked last night, the starting price of a 992 Turbo S had not crept, but leapt up to £180,000, meaning that one of these with some spec on is easily going to be 200,000 quid. This means that now, though yes, it has the performance to equal a Ferrari, an Aston Martin or a Bentley, it also has the price to equal them too. And a few years ago, the Ferrari Roma didn't exist. Now it does. And on paper, yes, the turbo will beat it. It's faster, it's lighter, it has all-wheel drive, and it's a lovely thing, it's a Porsche. People know them, people feel comfortable with them. Yeah, sure, once you've actually spec'd it, the Roma is going to be a bit more money, but both now are available on the used marketplace. And for me, well, a Roma looks far more special, it feels more special inside. The engine and the gearbox, well, they're night and day better. They are so, so much more engaging. And certainly if it's dry out, well, the Roma is just a lot more fun for me. It's a fabulous car. It's also practical. Really, if you want to use it day to day and you need the back seats, you want that two plus two thing, the Roma's probably got this beat. And how often can I say that a Ferrari is the practical option compared with a Porsche? Not frequently. Sure, it'll never do this. <laughs> I found the limit of traction eventually, and it was in first gear at full throttle. This car really can put the power down, honestly. Many a supercar day like today, well, I'd feel like it was a wasted journey. Not this thing, though. The steering still isn't as brilliant as some other old 911s, but you know what? I'm actually not going to complain about it. Could it be a 10 out of 10 steering wise? Yeah, it should be. Other 911s have been. This is instead 9 out of 10. I'm happy with it. It's got weighting, it's got feel. I like it. The suspension also, once you do press on, does start to work. But there isn't just the Roma. We also now have the Aston Martin DB12 and the new Vantage, which actually starts at less money than this. That's going to be about 165 grand. And it has basically the same amount of power. Not so sure I'm keen on the looks, but the interior is now every bit as good, if not better, than the 911s, and I'm keen to see what it drives like. It also has more cylinders, which for some people will mean a lot, and yes, okay, it's missing the back seats, but if you want those, get the DB12. And this means that now more than ever, competition is stronger for the 911. The Continental GT, of course, is a good shout if you do want something with full back seats, but honestly, that's not a car that I'm really in love with. The Roma is. And you know what? I do like 
the 992 Turbo S, and I think it might actually be my favorite of all the 992s. And I've got to say, I did not think I was going to say that this morning, but never let it be said that JM is not a man that will change his mind when presented with a bit of evidence. And a fine bit of evidence this has been. So I want to say a big, big thank you to David for bringing it out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.